of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed. The sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. Silent as he stood accused, Beaten, mocked, and scorned Bowing to the Father's will He took a crown of thorns Oh, the rugged cross, my salvation Where your love poured out over me Now my soul cries out Praise and honor unto Thee. Sent of heaven, God's own Son, to purchase and redeem, and reconcile the very ones who nailed Him to that tree. Oh, the rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, it's free in me. Oh, the rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee. See, the stone is rolled away, behold the empty tomb. Hallelujah, God be praised, he's risen from the grave. Across my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee. Praise and honor unto thee. Easter to everyone. We're glad you're here. A few announcements before we begin our worship time. Uh, we have the possibility of doing a vacation Bible school near the end of August, but we need volunteers. Right now, I think we have five, but we really need ten. So if you are able to do it, willing to do it, uh, please let us know. Uh, we'll try for one more week. If we don't have enough volunteers by next Sunday, we're probably going to have to wait uh, to do that ministry. So if you would like to be part of that. Okay. Now i got to put it back on my belt. Sorry for the interruption. Do I need to start over? Over? Okay. Okay. We have uh, Bible study ongoing, several. Uh, college and career Bible study on Romans, and that meets uh, Thursdays at 7.15 at the home of Nathan and Laura Priddle. 
There's an adult Bible study that meets via Zoom at 7.30 on Wednesday evening. And that is led by Reed Campbell. And that is on Leviticus, which has been very interesting. Then uh, there's a men's Bible study on the sacraments. That meets at my house at 7.30 on Thursday. And there's ISMC study groups, which meet uh, at various times in various places. You can contact Will or Chief Perry for those. And then there's a women's Bible study on First Peter, led by Laura Priddle. And that meets on Wednesday morning at 9.30. But if you come early for coffee, tea, or snacks, I think early means like 9.15, uh, then you can have some of those. So let's go to the Lord and ask his blessing. Father in heaven, as we come to worship you this morning, we are reminded that you alone are worthy of our praise and adoration. And it's in your name that we come before you. Amen. Stand for the call to worship. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ the Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The Lord is risen today, Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high, Alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply, Alleluia. the seal, hallelujah. Christ has burst the gates of hell, hallelujah. Death in vain forbids his rise, hallelujah. Christ hath opened paradise, hallelujah. Glorious King, Alleluia. Where, O oh, death, is now thy sting, Alleluia. Once he died our souls to save, Alleluia. Where thy victory, O oh, thy grave, Alleluia. Christ has led, Alleluia. Following our exalted head, Alleluia. Made like Him, like Him we rise, Alleluia. Ours across the grave, the skies, Alleluia. To thee by both be given, Alleluia. Thee we greet triumphant now, Alleluia. Hail the resurrection thou, Alleluia. Seated. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Isaiah, chapter 52, verses 3 through 10. And this is God's word. For thus says the Lord, You were sold for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, My people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing. Now therefore, what have I here, declares the Lord? seeing that my people are taken away for nothing. The rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually all 
the day my name is despised. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, they shall know what it is I, that it is I who speak. Here am I. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Our call to repentance is from Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Preserve me, O oh my God, you are my refuge true. I say to you, are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. The saints throughout the earth, in them is my delight. For excellent are they who live as holy in your sight. Though seeking other gods shall multiply their pain, their gifts and blood I offer not, their gods I will not name. O Lord, if you are to me, my cup and portion sure. For thought that you assign to me, you guard and keep secure. The lot that fell to me is beautiful and fair. The heritage in which I dwell is good beyond compare. I praise the Lord above, whose counsel guides aright. My heart instructs me in his love in seasons of the night. I keep before me still the Lord whom I have proved. At my right hand he guards from ill, and I shall not be moved. My heart is therefore glad my tongue with joy will sing, my body too will rest secure in hope unwavering. For you will not forsake my soul unto the grave, nor will you leave your holy to see the tombs decay. Life's pathway you make known, full joy of boundless store is found with you at your right hand, our pleasures evermore. Let's confess our sin together. Almighty God, we come to you in sorrow for our sins to humbly confess to you our unbelief. While we know and believe that Jesus died for us on the cross and that he was raised for us from the dead, we admit it often makes too little difference in our lives. Forgive us, we pray. Enable us to fully embrace the truth of the gospel, that our love for you may flourish 
that our obedience may be wholehearted and joyful, and that our witness may be more courageous. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and triumphant Lord. Amen. Silently confess your sin to God. Amen. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Please stand as we sing, Worship Christ, the Risen King. Rise, O church, and lift your voices, Christ has conquered death and hell. Sing as all the earth rejoices, resurrection anthem swell. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the risen King. See the tomb where death had laid him empty, now its mouth declares. Death and I could not contain him, for the throne of life he shares. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the risen King. Hear the earth protest and tremble, see the stone removed with power. All hell's minions may assemble, but cannot withstand his hour. He has conquered, he has conquered, Christ the Lord, the risen King. Doubt may lift its head to murmur, scoffers mock and sinners cheer. But the truth proclaims a wonder, thoughtful hearts receive with cheer. He has risen, he has risen, now receive the risen King. We acclaim your life, O oh Jesus, now we sing your victory. Sin or hell may seek to seize us, but your conquest keeps us free. Stand in triumph, stand in triumph, worship Christ the risen King. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost. To redeem the whole creation, he endured the cursed cross. For even in your suffering, he saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for our sake you died. Praise the Father, praise 
praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. The morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, now the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Oh, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, praise forever to the King of Kings. You may be seated and at this time children are dismissed to go down to Children's Church. It's always a parade. Our New Testament reading is from the Epistle to the Romans, chapter 10, beginning in verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down? Or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him the dead you will be saved for the heart with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved for the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all bestowing his riches on all who call on him for everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved how then will we call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him who have they never, who in him they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? And it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what, what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, in humility you came to us, not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. You came sent by your Father because you loved us, because in very nature God you did not consider equality with God something to be used to your own advantage. Rather, you made yourself nothing 
by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness, you became one of us. As a human being, you humbled yourself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, even though by your spirit you are powerful and intimately present in us and among us. God has exalted you to the highest place and has given you the name that is above every name, that at your name, Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, even as we bow, therefore, now with humble joy and adoration. Today, we laugh, we sing, we feast. We do what one day every tongue on earth from every tribe, tongue, and nation, cherubim and seraphim, and all creation will do. By the grace of your spirit, we praise, honor, and worship you, Jesus Christ, the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Lord, we lift up to you the churches and ministries that we support, the missionaries, among them ISMC, which reaches out to the college and university students here in Halifax and the greater Halifax area. We pray for Christ Church Halifax, which is being planted downtown. We pray for Harbor Light Church in Sydney. And we ask your blessing on those ministries. We pray for Kevin Burrell as he undergoes treatment for his cancer. We pray that to be effective. Lord, we pray for those persecuted throughout the world, Christians persecuted in various places in the world. And we know that even today, on Easter Sunday, some are having to hide to worship you. We pray that you would sustain them. We pray for Israel, that it would be able to withstand the attacks from Hamas and others. We pray for Ukraine, that the incursion from Russia would end. And we pray that we would be a people who are evangelistic, who have fervor to tell others about the wonderful gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And for the Lord, we pray for Don and Lois Codling. We pray for Don's uh, healing to continue and for him and Lois to be restored to full health. And we thank you for the blessing they are to our church family. And we pray all these things in the name of your Son and our Savior Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Our gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, the first 19 verses. If you have your Bible, you can open there and read along. If you don't, you can see it on the screen. Hear now the word of the Lord. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter called Thomas, Simon Peter Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. 
They said to him, We'll go with you. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, No. He said to them, Cast on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus revealed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Follow me. Father in heaven, as we come to your word, we pray that you would add to the reading the blessing of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now when you've been in the ministry as long as I have, which is um, going on 40 years. Please don't try to add it and figure out how old I am. You've had many opportunities to talk on Easter Sunday morning, to preach on Easter Sunday morning. And so there's always a sort of a decision to make as to which passage am I going to talk about? Because there's none of them that I haven't preached on and some of them that I've preached on here with you in the last 11 years. Easter's. So today I want to talk to you about this passage we read. And there are several things about this passage that strike me as I read it. The disciples are fishing and Jesus is on the shore. And when they catch the fish and they're coming ashore, it says when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. What's going on here? Jesus wasn't fishing. They were fishing. They caught 153 fish, but Jesus already had fish. He already had a fire. He already had bread. How did that happen? The other thing about it is Jesus is eating. Now there's an account in Luke where Jesus shows up in Luke 24, beginning in verse 36. He shows up uh, in the upper room with the disciples. He says, Peace to you. And they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do your doubts enter your heart? See my hands and feet? It is myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones that you see I have. And he showed them his hands and feet. And they were marveling. He said to them, Do you have anything to eat? 
And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took and ate it before them. So Jesus is in a spirit. He's been raised in the same body that was crucified. And yet he can show up on the shore unannounced and have a fire going with fish and bread. Where did he get it? Now this is a detail that if you're making up a story about something that didn't happen, you wouldn't include it. Because it gives rise to too many questions. The only reason that you would include it is if it happened. And that's the first thing I want us to notice is the authenticity of the gospel accounts. This passage is a great example of that. The disciples didn't know it was Jesus. Now, if you're making it up, you wouldn't say that. Now, you might say, well, fiction writers say things like that all the time in order to prove, not to prove, in order to make it sound authentic. And they do. But that form of fiction did not exist at the time of Jesus. In fact, it didn't exist for over a thousand years after Jesus. So in order to believe that this detail was added so that it would sound more realistic, sound more authentic, you would have to believe that the gospel writers, one time only, used this form of prose and then nobody ever did it again for a thousand years. It's not believable. In verse 7, the disciple whom Jesus loved said, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it, he put on his outer garment and jumped in the sea. And that's exactly the opposite of what you would expect to happen. I mean, most people take off garments to go swimming. Again, why would you make this up? Verse 11, Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net full of large fish, 153 of them. Now, 153 is quite a detail. And it's an unnecessary detail. And there's been all sorts of really silly speculations by theologians over the years exactly what 153 meant. But the most likely reason is that somebody counted them and included it in the story. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? It seems there's been a recognition problem. They didn't immediately recognize Jesus. Mary Magdalene at the tomb thought he was a gardener. The disciples on the Maus Road didn't recognize him at first. And if you're writing an account, trying to convince people that something happened that didn't happen, it doesn't make sense to add doubt to the story. But the Gospels are full of incidents which make the adherence of this new religion look bad. For example, the disciples squabble over who is the greatest. In fact, the mother of James and John asked Jesus to make sure that James and John can sit on the right and left of him when he comes to his kingdom. Another is when Jesus feeds the 5,000. Remember, they take up 12 baskets of scraps. And when he feeds the 4,000, They take up seven baskets of scraps. And yet on these occasions, the disciples are still worried about where they're going to get lunch. That's not very complimentary of the people that are supposedly starting this new religion. They're unable to perform an exorcism. They rebuke children from coming to see Jesus, and Jesus tells them, Suffer the little children to come to me and forbid them not. And at the very end, although they promised, they promised that they would never desert him, they did. Even Peter denied him like a coward after his death or while he was imprisoned. There are other examples of these things which don't make sense unless they happen. Jesus' inaugural miracle 
was at a wedding to help a couple avoid social embarrassment. And during this, it seems he was crossed with his mother. Duke University professor, the late Reynolds Price, said the story reeks of authenticity. It's not only the Gospels, but many of the Bible's main characters have flaws and failings. For example, you remember the story of Noah after, after the flood and after uh, they come safely ashore. He gets drunk. Abraham, when his wife Sarah was unable to conceive, had a baby with Sarah's maid Hagar. Two times, Abraham when confronted, when, when visiting, sojourning through other lands, tried to pass off his sister as his wife. I mean, his wife as his sister. Twice. His son Isaac does the same thing with Rebecca. Jacob cheats his brother, Esau. Moses kills an Egyptian. David commits adultery with one of his friend's wife and then has him killed. Then we have the disciples, as I mentioned. Now, so what's going on here? So much of modern evangelicals try to hold up Bible characters as great examples of character. But that misses the point entirely because the Bible is not about God's people, at least not primarily. They are not the heroes in the Bible. God is. The Bible is the story of his redemption of lost sinners through his son Jesus Christ. And all of these people, with all of their faults, with all of their failings, with all of their foibles. They're saved by a merciful, redeeming God. So the story is authentic. Second thing is, is, is there's a reminder. Much of Israel's religious worship revolved around remembering what God has done for us. It almost always involves food. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits or harvest, feast of the weeks, feast of trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, the feast of booths or tabernacles. All of these are food-related remembrances of what God has done. For Christians, we remember the atoning death of Christ on the cross and his propitiation for our sins when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And here in this passage, Jesus calls the disciples once again to share a meal with him. But it isn't just food. <laughs> It's a reminder of what he has done for them. Maybe you remember the story of the great catch of fish in Luke chapter 5. This is sort of a, a bookend to Jesus' ministry with Peter, especially. Because Peter was a fisherman. Remember, they were fishing by the lake of Gennesaret. Jesus was teaching on the shore he borrowed one of the boats and put it out into the lake. When he sat down, he taught the people. And when he had finished, he said, Put out of the deep and let your nets down for a catch. And Simon said, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. I was going to try to do a Jewish accent, but I changed my mind. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and the nets were breaking. This, this is the same kind of thing 
that we just read about in John 21 here in Luke 5 at the beginning of Simon ministry with him or Jesus ministry with Simon the nets were breaking they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them but when Simon Peter saw it he fell down at Jesus knees and said depart from me for I am a sinful man O Lord for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken So also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to them, said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now, they've they've left everything and followed him. And now Peter here, maybe because he is still feeling guilt over his denial of Jesus, he decides to go back to fishing. And we don't know if it's a one-time thing or if they just decided they're going to go back to fishing altogether. But Jesus, in this chapter, is reminding them that their task is not to be fishers of fish. Their life's work is to be fishers of men, to be evangelists, to proclaim the good news, to be missionaries. By repeating this great catch of fish, he's, excuse me, he's reminding them of who they are and what they're to be doing. By including the bread and the breakfast, he's reminding them of the feeding of the 5,000 and 4,000 when he provided so much food by multiplying the loaves and the fishes. He's reminding them by engaging all of their senses, sight, touch, smell, sound, taste, are all involved in the reminder of who he is, what he's done, who they are, and what they're called to do. And I think this is a reminder or an example of how we should remind ourselves of the same thing. We gather on Sunday morning and we sing and pray together. We hear the Bible taught together. We talk and share food with each other afterwards. When we do these things, we are reminded of the same things as the disciples. Who God is, what he has done for us in his son Jesus, what we are to do. We especially affirm these things when we eat and drink the Lord's Supper together. But we need to remind ourselves as well. Remind ourselves and mercy and goodness to us. How? How do we do that? I mean, Jesus isn't going to show up on shore with breakfast for us, at least. He hasn't for me. So how do we do this? First of all, you have to regularly read God's Word. You might say, well, I don't have time for that. Let me remind you of God's word through Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. Take to heart all the words which I am commanding you today that you may command to your children that you may be careful to do all the words of this law for it is no empty word for you but your very life. By this word you shall live long in the land you are going over the Jordan to possess. It is no empty word. Another version says it's no idle word. I don't know, uh, I can't know without asking each individual person how often you read your Bible, how much of your Bible you read when you do. But it should be a daily thing because it isn't an idle word for you. And this is how we are connected with the Lord. This is how we spend time with Jesus. Scriptures are about the importance of knowing God. The Word of God trains us. In Paul's second letter to Timothy, he says, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. The Word of God directs us. 
Your lamp, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119. We're to meditate on God's word. The word of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you meditate on it day and night and be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. The word of God is our sword. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And the Bible helps us to follow God's desires. Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And finally, the word of God guides us. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, Paul writes in Romans 15.4, so that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Are we seeking God with our whole heart? Are we holding his word close to us? But this is not the only way to be reminded. Hebrews says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the living and new way he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he, he who has promised is faithful. And let us to consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the day is drawing near. Now I notice we have an especially full church today by comparison to the last several weeks. And that's a good thing, and I'm happy for it. But I want to encourage you to make that the normal thing. Do not neglect coming to worship, to be reminded of who God is and that you're part of a family. Now I mentioned that I love nature shows several times and if you've ever seen one where the, the lions hunt, what you'll notice is that they work together to try to separate a weak antelope or zebra from the rest of the herd. A weak one or a young one so that they can catch it and kill it and eat it. And that's exactly what Peter is saying when he says our adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion. He's trying to panic the flock with adversity or tempt the flock with negligence or lethargy or pride. When the animals stay together and face the lions, the lions give up and look for easier pickings. Worshiping together every week, studying the Bible together, praying together, meeting and sharing meals together, since we are called to be ambassadors inviting unbelievers to hear the good news. God will provide what we need both here and in an ultimate sense for all of us in eternity. When Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? He was restoring him by giving him the opportunity to declare three times, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And while it grieves Peter in the moment, I believe it was healing for him. And as an example or a proof of that, I want us to look at two passages in the book of Acts, chapter 2 and chapter 4. Chapter 2, verse 22. Peter is preaching now. This is after the Holy Spirit has been given. Listen, this is, compare this to the man who 
was sitting around the fire while Jesus was imprisoned, and a servant girl said to him, You were with Jesus, weren't you? You were one of them. I was not. Yes, you were. I think I saw you with him. I'm paraphrasing. No, I wasn't. Sure you were. I don't even know the man. So that compared with this. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you know yourselves. This Jesus delivered up according to the infinite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Think about that. What he was unwilling to admit to a servant girl around a fire with a few other people, he's now proclaiming in open public that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus was crucified by them, that Jesus is the Savior of the world, that he rose from the dead. What changed? What changed? Jesus did rise from the dead. Jesus met with him and restored him. Jesus sent him and the others the Holy Spirit. Now then, there's another passage in Acts chapter 4, and what has happened is Peter and John have healed somebody, a crippled man. And they got into trouble for it because they were saying it was done in the name of Jesus. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, in verse 8, Rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man, by, by him this man is standing before you well. Jesus is the stone rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now listen to what is next. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, again, boldness now, cowardice then, they perceived that they were uneducated common men and they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So the question for you, the question for me, the question for all of us is, have you been with Jesus? Have you been with him so much that you recognize and your spirit has been filled by, your, you've been filled by the Holy Spirit? You're so sure of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. that you will not, you cannot help but tell others about him. So listen to what they say next. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. I wish that was true of all of us. I'm going to embarrass him now. But all of us on Wednesday night Bible study are continually, I don't know, astounded, impressed, surprised. That Chris is always telling a story about somebody that he just met that he's talking to about the gospel. And people say, I'd like to know how you do that. Well, this is how you do it. You open your mouth and you start talking. That's how you do it. And what comes out is that you've been with Jesus, that you love Jesus, that you believe that he rose from the dead and you confess with your mouth that he is Lord and that you know you're saved. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you don't know all those things. 
I'm encouraging you then to believe in Jesus, to believe that He is the Son of God, that He lived a sinless life on this earth in your place. He lived the life you should have lived and then He died the death that you deserve to die and then He rose from the dead and sits at the right hand of God the Father. I'm encouraging you to be with Jesus. Now, not everybody has to be as bold as Chris. I'm not sure Chris has always been bold. I was kind of like that when I was first a Christian. I was, couldn't shut me up. But I'm not, I know that's not everybody, but you have opportunities to tell people about the risen Savior. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Pray that we would be people who do take the opportunity to tell others about Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Crown him with many crowns, a lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. And hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of love, behold him. Hands and side, rich wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward bends his burning eye at mystery so bright. Crown him the Lord of peace whose power a scepter sways from pole to pole that wars may cease absorbed in prayer and praise his reign shall know no end and round his pierced feet fair flowers of paradise extend their fragrance ever sweet Crown him the Lord of years, the potentate of time, creator of the rolling spheres, ineffably sublime. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise shall never, never fail throughout eternity. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is risen. Thanks be to God.
to thy glorious rest above. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus spread his praise from shore to shore. How he loveth, ever loveth, changeth never, never more. How he watches o'er his loved ones, died to call them all his own. How for them he interceded, watcheth o'er them from the throne. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, love of every love the best. Tis an ocean vast a blessing, tis a haven sweet of rest. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, tis a heaven of heavens to me, and it lifts me up to glory, for it lifts me up to Thee. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, Tis a heaven of heavens to me, and it lifts me up to glory, for it lifts me up to thee.